Hi. It's such a pleasure to be here. I am a medical doctor, but I am probably the only one you would not call if you had an actual breach. Um, so I am Dr. Lamurabit. I'm the executive director of Phase Minus One and a UN high-level commissioner on uh, health, employment, and economic growth. And my focus really is comprehensive and inclusive security strategies. As we've heard today, security means a multitude of different things to different people. So my business partner, for example, is a three-star general. His security to him means all his troops coming home safe. Uh, security to many of you in this room means your ability to protect your online space or potentially to innovate and to explore. And security to my mom would mean that her kids get to go to school and come home safely. So security itself is a contested concept, and we have to bring that to the table when we look at its relationship with health specifically. So before I begin looking at health and securitization of health in, in, in its own shell, we're going to look at what securitization is as a whole. Now, we've probably heard of the war on terror, the war on drugs, the war on migration, etc. And often that speech act, that panic-inducing speech act of having a legitimate conflict with an existential threat is perceived. So what securitization is, is that an elite group, usually the government and the media, will claim that something is a significant threat to a defined referent object. That's oftentimes a group within the population or the population as a whole, right? And how they'll do this is through panic-inducing speech acts. So you'll have CNN with their countdowns of like 46 hours away, the vote on God knows what. And everybody begins to get terrified and think, you know, even though they're living in Wisconsin, they're as likely to contract Ebola as they are the common cold. Now, in order for securitization to work, and what makes it unique is it's actually quite reciprocal. It's interestingly enough based on some trust because the audience has to believe you. So there's a lot of people, you could go to Hyde Park on Sunday and see them who will talk about the end of the world, right? But you have to actually buy into it. And that's the key thing. So when securitization happens, we go from normal politics, a rule of law and open political discourse where you can debate issues and is this where we should be investing our money and does this make sense and are these the right people we should be working with and talking to, to panic politics, which is often political secrecy, limited political debate, and of course violations of acceptable human rights law. So things like containment and restriction of mobility for particular minorities. Now, when we look at the health and security nexus, it's quite interesting because it's probably one of our oldest securitization strategies. Health has always been securitized. It goes back to colonialism and pre-exists the Westphalian state system. Then we can look at the securitization of health prior to World War II and the Cold War, and of course the reemergence of health as a security threat, which I'm sure many of you have been reading about daily as, as the great threat of the 21st century. So in the legacy of colonialism, Herbert Lotley, who is the French general who colonized Morocco, often called the maker of Morocco, once said, the physician, if he understands his role, is the most effective of our agents of penetration and pacification. I have a few problems with this statement, but my key one is that the physician is automatically assumed to be a man, and I just find that pretty sexist. So this guy's off base. But it's very indicative of a larger strategy. Health was used throughout colonialism and, and traditional nation state building as a tool to control, to manipulate, and oftentimes to depopulate minorities and populations. So if we look at South African migrant workers and the fact that they were repeatedly monitored uh, and their health was controlled, if we look at the depopulation of migrant trade routes in Africa and the fact that they were completely closed off to anybody except for colonizing populations. Now, what's very important when we look at recent outbreaks is the history of colonialism in terms of where diseases came from. A lot of diseases did not inherently exist in colonized populations. They were brought in with colonizers. So now when you had the outbreak of Ebola in 2014, significant portions of the population said, hey, wait a second, this isn't our disease. You guys are trying to depopulate us again and felt scared to actually go and get treatment. Those become key. The fact that traditionally containment has been the ultimate strategy when it came to infectious disease meant that militaries were always the ones mobilized. So now in recent history when we've mobilized militaries, there is a fear. Now, a lot of people think this is quite distant, but this legacy actually is pretty recent as well if we look at the history of eugenics and the fact that up until the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, 
We were using things like forced abortion and scientific study on minorities to control the threat of an emerging minority population. Now, this is not unusual. I mean, if we go back to 404 BC, Thucydides commented on how the plague impacted Athenian military and governance capability. That's why they lost. If we look at the 1500s, 14 and 1500s, we're talking about how the plague completely devastated uh, the European ability to expand, particularly, for example, South and Spanish and uh, Southern European expansion in Spain. And now, as I had mentioned earlier, containment was the way that we tended to conduct things until they realized, wait a second, with the Industrial Revolution, we have trade, we have transport, and we can't stop diseases at borders no matter how hard we try. So for the first time ever in 1851, you saw multilateral cooperation at the International Sanitary Conference in Paris. And this is key because it's really the, the building block for things like the WHO and the international health regulations, which do command a lot of control on the way in which we engage with epidemics today. Now, health as a national security threat reemerged prominently after the Cold War. There was a lull there where we didn't necessarily look at health as the key issue. It was more material capabilities, who has nuclear weapons, who has more uh, territorial control. But it became exceptionally important, particularly in the 1980s and 90s. And that was with the reemergence, or the, sorry, the emergence of HIV and AIDS. When HIV and AIDS emerged, a lot of governments found themselves at a standstill. It completely devastated governments locally, but also there was the question of minority politics. In the United States, Haitians obviously came under significant accusations, as did the, the LGBTQ community, which was told that it was responsible for it. And we found that HIV and AIDS tended to cause significant discourse in the community. Now, this was paralleled with the UNDP, citing health as a significant disruption in people's lives and a significant security concern, any type of pandemic outbreak. They went as far as to say a common cold would be concerning, but especially an infectious disease, a hemorrhagic infectious disease to a degree. Now, of course, this was validated in 2001 by the anthrax, increased, uh, anthrax increasing concerns and, of course, the SARS outbreak in 2002. And while anthrax may seem like it's coming out of left field, it's actually quite important because it increased public and private concern about the ability for a health crisis to devastate a population, whether it was manufactured or organic. And of course, in 2000, we had HIV and AIDS resolution. It was the first time the United Nations Security Council ever debated, ever an infectious disease or any type of health crisis as a global security concern. This was only done once again with Ebola in 2014. In between the two of those, we had the 2004 United Nations Secretary General commission a high-level panel on threats, challenges, and change. And in it, he cited health security as one of the biggest challenges and threats of the coming time. Now, what's important here is it's not only a multilateral shift that we're seeing. In our national health strategies, and our, sorry, our national security strategies, and I'm going to pick on the United States here just because they give such good numbers. In 1998, Bill Clinton in his national security strategy mentioned health once, and it was HIV and AIDS, one time. Eight years later, Bush had it in his in six out of nine chapters, again focusing predominantly on HIV and AIDS. By 2015, Obama had it in every chapter every chapter, and it didn't just talk about HIV and AIDS, or even just Ebola, it talked about the threat of bioterrorism, it talked about control, it talked about multilateral cooperation on research, it talked about literally everything, and it resourced it as well. And oftentimes, from the policy level, we say if there's money behind it, then there's actual interest. And there became a lot of money behind it. So you're probably wondering, if people have been doing it so long, our nation states have been built on it, then what's the downside? The reality is, it is very good at creating political and even to a degree public awareness, right? It's also very good at ensuring that resources are funneled where they need to go, which is to combating the disease. We can argue about whether or not it's done properly. It's also pretty effective at the UN Security Council level of forcing national accountability on a country that isn't taking accountability itself. But while we recognize those pros, we also have to recognize what can go wrong, and traditionally, what has gone wrong when it comes to securitization. The first and foremost is that securitization is built on a colonial model. Who gets to decide when you securitize something? Where do you securitize and why? 
I mean, if we remember 2014, 4,000 West Africans had died before it was ever brought to the United Nations or to the WHO as, an, as, an, as a global security concern. And the reason it was brought was because of the infection of two Americans. That's what the data shows us. The media spike was quite significant as well. So we have to ask ourselves, who gets to determine and why? And that brings us to other questions. It brings us to the reality that oftentimes we're not necessarily securitizing the disease, we end up securitizing the diseased. People get stigmatized, ostracized, excluded, and it exacerbates social and economic discrepancies. Worse than that is the fact that it also leads to significant long-term economic depletion. As a commissioner on health and economic growth, I look at the relationship between the two, and I'm sure none of you are surprised that it's actually quite startling. Health tends to be the number one determinant of economic growth for a country and a people. Now, in 2014, 41 countries closed their borders, violating international health regulations when, Ebola when the Ebola outbreak occurred. That didn't just mean they closed their borders then, but it also meant that the long-term economic destruction has not stopped. Those countries have not been able to recuperate. And with economic destruction comes civil discord. There's a lack of trust in the government and their ability to provide safety and security for the people. And above and beyond everything else, that's actually probably the scariest thing. Much like in the 14 and 1500s, we've noticed that constant and unmitigated securitization leads to decreased citizen trust in the state and in the state's capabilities. And unlike the 1950s and 40s where you needed the state for everything, you needed them for information and education and support and transportation and healthcare, guess what? We have corporations and non-state actors who do a lot of that work for us. The state's real main work today is meant to be the protection of its populace. So the growing sentiment, statistically, that the state cannot protect and support has led to an increase in anti-establishment support and populist voting, where they say, listen, if you can't deal with this threat, we're gonna vote for somebody who's serious about it. Now, these are the realities. It's also bolstered by the fact that people are scared of the reality of bioterrorism. Diseases can be weaponized, we already know that. Some believe they can be genetically modified. Some believe they can be genetically coded to a specific minority or group. And those who don't think that's gonna happen in the next five or 10 years definitely think it's happening in the next 15. That is valid when we look at the 71% of Britons between the age of 16 and 75 who are more concerned about the spread of infectious disease than they are about war. And we look at the fact that most global thought leaders are saying, you know what? It's actually health security that is gonna be our biggest crisis of the 21st century. We can see that based on the financial support they're putting behind this, but also the political weight. So the question we then have to ask is, if this is the reality, what can we do about it? Now I have five very simple recommendations that we can more or less learn just from knowing our past. If we look at history, if we look at the breakdown of citizen-state trust over constant securitization in the past, if we look at the challenges that existed and how they were solved, we can better understand what we can do today. The first is to demilitarize pandemic response. In Sierra Leone, when the, when the Ebola outbreak happened, they mobilized their army for the first time since the Civil War. Now, if you're a citizen and you're already terrified of Ebola, imagine how scared you are now. We need to demilitarize pandemic response and prioritize local expertise. That means not sending in doctors from New York or from Brussels, but instead asking people locally what's working and what's not. Because sending in foreign doctors has not traditionally been a positive thing in most of the developing world. We also need to invest in local healthcare professionals and proactively strengthen healthcare institutions. And what we mean by that is it doesn't work to simply invest $8 billion in fighting Ebola one year and then $0 in those same communities. It also means that things like the IMF, which work towards financing, need to better finance governments that cannot pay for healthcare themselves. In, in parts of Africa, you have 200,000 people per one doctor, per one doctor, when our recommendation is to have, at the minimum, one doctor per thousand. 
that is a huge jump. And we need to start talking about who's actually going to be in these communities on the front lines working with them that they trust. And the last thing is to promote responsive science. As people's concerns grow about bioterrorism and disease and, and weaponizing disease, we need to be able to share between academics and doctors and institutions, we need to be able to share our research real time so that we can actually have more open and honest communication about what we're seeing and what we're not. That can also alleviate a lot of people's panic. And of course, if all else fails, and this is the most important one, we simply need to call my niece.